Hello guys, <laughs> David Vos here. Well, it's raining out right now. It's just been coming down all night. Hope you're having a wonderful day, guys. Hey guys, I got a question for you. When did the apostasy arise? You know, we've talked about this a little bit in the past. There certainly are many opinions. Well, there might be kind of stages to this. <clears throat> a lot of people think it was... Uh, the Nicene Creed, 325 A.D. I've said there were moments that seemed to be quite uh, disturbing events in, in the history of man that seemed to be a great apostasy. We've got, we've got 395 when the flame went out, which was the, um, the vestal virgins that would keep this flame going. And this, these are the Lucinian mysteries, the, the uh, Latin mysteries that go back to ancient days. We've talked about uh, modern times. I believe if a Christian looks around, somebody who has any inkling of what the Bible teaches and is a Christian, we look around the world, we see a lot of things like transgenderism and people who just vile and vulgar. Uh, they don't believe in the divine being. You might say uh, Nietzsche or something. You know, the divine being is dead. Karl Marx. There are various things that one could say this was when the apostasy occurred. But of course, as you guys know, I believe that the latter days began really after World War II. From that point forward, we started having, you know, these huge events in history to try and deceive mankind in such a way. Uh, the Roswell thing. It just, I, 19, somewhere around 1945 or something, right at the end of World War II. Uh, the moon landing, what a hoax, right? The great deception began. 9-11, this just keeps going, you know. Uh, desert storm, weapons of mass destruction, Pearl Harbor, the Bellflower Agreement, the Bolshevik Revolution, many things that were huge. But I will tell you what I believe is the most pivotal action or occurrence in world history that I think one could say, okay, that was the apostasy. That it. That's what, that was the final straw. That was the most... And what would it be? Well, it would be certainly falling away into sin, right? But sin, what is it? It's when we have a conscience, we know what we're doing, and we purposefully and, and literally turn away from the divine being and his love. It doesn't mean something, somebody did something wrong. I mean, because people can do things wrong. We make mistakes. We're children. We're his children. So it wouldn't, you could point to any evil deed ever in the history of man and you could always say, well, that was just one person or, you know, or a group of individuals. But on a world scale, when the world turned from the true worship of the true deity and went back to worshiping the devil, went back to the old covenant, went back under law, which means no longer under grace, but we put ourselves back into the hands of this deity of wrath who blinds the minds of the unbelievers. That would be the point in which I would say is the great apostasy. You know, Jehovah's Witnesses created a society, a Bible Watchtower, Bible, and Track Society, and a printing press, and they began to mass produce books, magazines, and tracts and pamphlets. And they also invented Hollywood, the phonograph, the first motion picture, and they began to throw this into the equation and mass hysteria and propaganda. So that's got to be when this 
propaganda got started just right after World War II. And it got started by a bunch of Bavarians in Hollywood that was brought over here by Charles Chase Russell. I did videos on this. There was a group of these Bavarians from Germany that were brought over here after World War I and after World War II. Most people know about the ones that came over after World War II. And they call that the Project Paperclip. But there was a group that came over after World War I and they were brought over by Charles Taze Russell. They started Hollywood. But in 19... Uh, I think it was I, the Watchtower's first edition, 1880 or 1881, I don't remember their first Watchtower. You know, today it says announcing Jehovah's Kingdom. That's the name, that's what they announce on the Watchtower. But when they first started the Watchtower, it actually said that in their charter as to what the point of the magazine was and this organization. But it was to worship Jesus. That's what it was. And Almighty Divine Being. It didn't even use the word Jehovah. This idea of Jehovah, Jehovah, Jehovah started years later after Charles Taze Russell actually died. They weren't known as Jehovah's Witnesses. They were known known as Bible students. So at that time, the world believed, and I, and I know this, even when I was a kid, we'd, we'd, you'd go out in field service, and you'd knock on the door and say, oh, we're Jehovah's Witnesses, and they're like, oh, that's the devil. And, and, and I had people at the door tell me, no, no, Jehovah's the devil. We worship Jesus. And I'm like, oh, this is terrible. No, no, no. <clears throat> but they began to change their tune, started worshiping Jehovah. I don't know, in like 1930s or something. Well, in 1954, the Watchtower publication said this. Is it okay to worship Jesus? And in that article, they flipped. And they said, no, we should never worship Jesus. He was only a man, and we cannot worship him. And nowhere in the Bible does it say that we should worship him. That, my friends, was the beginning of the apostasy. Yeah, I want to show you this. This is from J.W. Fax. Worship Jesus. Jehovah's Witnesses worshipped Jesus until 1954, after which they were told such worship was idolatrous. This made them a polytheistic religion for most of their history. The core to religion is the divine, and to change the divine you worship is to change the very essence and basis of religion. Hmm. So Russell promoted the worship of Jesus and prayer to him because he is our deity. And so Russell says in Zion's Watchtower in 1880, it seems clear that his divinity was retained in humanity because he repeatedly spoke of himself as having come down from heaven and because he, though passing through trial and sorrow as a man, was yet possessed of the authority and exercised the prerogatives of a god. He was the object of unreproved worship. In other words, he did not reprove them. Even when a babe by the wise men who came to see the newborn king in Matthew 2, 12, or 2, verse 2 through 11. Even the angels delighted to do him honor. Where it says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6, When he bringeth the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of the divine one worship him. And that word is truly the same word used throughout the New Testament for worship and the worship of the divine one. He never reproved anyone for acts of worship offered to himself. But when Cornelius offered such service to Peter, the leading apostle, he took him up saying, stand up. I myself also am a man. Had Christ not been more than a man, the same reason would have prevented him from receiving worship. That was in Zion's Watchtower. So, another uh, quote from the Watchtower in 1892. It is undoubtedly proper enough for us to address petitions to our Redeemer and Advocate, who loved us and gave himself for us. Although we are nowhere instructed to make petitions to him, it evidently could not be improper so to do. For such a course is nowhere prohibited, and the disciples worshipped him. 1892, May 15th. 
Here's another one in 1898. Question. The fact that our Lord received worship is claimed by some to be an evidence that while on earth he was the divine one, the father disguised in a body of flesh and not really a man, was he really worshipped or is the translation faulty? Answer. Yes, we believe our Lord Jesus while on earth was really worshipped and properly so. It was proper for our Lord to receive worship in view of his having been the only begotten of the Father and his agent in creation of all things, including man. 1906. In one respect, many of Christendom could learn numerous important lessons from these wise Gentiles. They worshipped him in three senses of the word. They fell before him, prostrated themselves, thus physically expressing their reverence. How many Christians get down on their knees in, 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 to Jesus anymore? And why are they not doing it? Because Jehovah's Witnesses have gone around publishing these pamphlets and Watchtower articles at this point now, and we'll, we'll show from 1954, where they've brought in this great apostasy on, and, and told the world not to worship Jesus. And I think they've convinced most people. They worshipped him in their hearts and with the tongue gave expression to the rejoicing and confidence. They opened their treasure box and presented it to him three gifts appropriate to royalty. Myrrh representing submission, frankincense representing praise, and gold representing obedience. That was 1906. In 1939, this is Jehovah Deity commands all to worship Christ Jesus because Christ Jesus is the express image of his father, Jehovah. See, now they're using the word Jehovah a lot. It's, it's, it's a gradual apostasy. And is the express image of his father, Jehovah, and because he is the executive officer of Jehovah, always carrying out Jehovah's purpose. See, in the beginning they just said, yeah, he's, he's the Lord. He's Worship him. Then they're like, well, he's, ex he's the executive, so we can worship him. So then in um, 1939, the people of all nations who obtain salvation must come to the house of the Lord to worship there. That is to say, they must believe in, on and worship Jehovah and the Lord Jesus. All right. 1945, they say, as Christ is coming to reign as the king in Jehovah's capital organization, Zion, to bring in a righteous new world, Jehovah makes him infinitely higher than the godly angels or messengers and accordingly commands them to worship him since Jehovah God now reigns as king by means of his capital organization Zion. Then whosoever would worship him must also worship and bow down to Jehovah's chief one in that capital organization. Well, they're kind of saying, you know, Jesus isn't really God, but he's the chief one in his organization, so we got to worship him too. Well, we can go on all the way down. They keep getting different teachings as we go. It just changes over and over again. But here's the 1954 Watchtower article. It says this. Should we worship Jesus? Consequently, since the scriptures teach that Jesus Christ is not a Trinitarian co-person with the God, the Father, but is a distinct person, the Son of God, the answer to the above question must be that no distinct worship is to be rendered to Jesus Christ, now glorified in heaven. Our worship is to go to Jehovah God. However, we should show the proper regard for God's only begotten Son by rendering our worship to God through and in the name of Jesus. You see how this has gotten to this point now. This is the great apostasy. Now, I know a lot of you are probably thinking, what? come on now, Dave. Jehovah's Witnesses aren't anybody. They're nobody. You're right. This isn't the, the Nicene Council or something. This is not something earth-shattering that would change the world. Well, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses might not be the biggest religion, or you might not think they are. Of course, they have, I think, as many or more kingdom halls than there are Catholic cathedrals and churches in the world. They have something like 8, 10 million active publishers. Forget people who actually attend or relatives, or people that are associated with Jehovah's Witnesses. Most people don't realize this. They have this huge skyscraper across the street from the United Nations building in Brooklyn with this watchtower, you know, announcing Jehovah. Now, if Jehovah is the devil, then 
it only became so in the last few years because of their apostasy, because of them publishing millions and millions. It's like, you know, McDonald's, millions sold, then it was billions, now it's billions and billions. Well, I mean, it, they, I don't know even know if there's a, a way to know how many Watchtowers Awakes and pamphlets that they published. Just their, the, the Truth Book and a few other little books and Paradise Restored or whatever these books they have, have sold millions and millions. One of the biggest all-time sellers is the Truth Book that Jehovah's Witnesses published. And their Bible, the New World Order Bible, it's like up there with the King James now. Everybody's got one. You go to a Goodwill thrift store or something, you look in there and they got always got a a Jehovah's Witness Bible. They're everywhere. It's like going to a motel and there's a Gideon Bible. Well, now you can go anywhere and find a Jehovah's Witness New World Order Bible and they said they put the name Jehovah back in there. Well, why, why was it out of there? Because Christians didn't believe in Jehovah. Christians for the first several hundred years didn't have a Hebrew Bible. There was no Jehovah in there. They only used the Greek Septuagint. And it nowhere used the word Jehovah. It was Lord. And there's probably some hanky-panky that's been going on. And we've, we've gone through the translations and, and different conspiracies and things that we can show where they didn't just take it out and then put it back in. But they probably didn't... It wasn't in there in the first place in many of the places that they put it in. So there's lots of controversies when Jehovah's Witnesses say they put it back in there seven, over 7,000 times. Many people say, well, it shouldn't have been in there that many times. So, but I don't want to get into that. The point I'm trying to make is that Jehovah's Witnesses, just like Seventh-day Adventists, who came along and now everybody thinks that we're under the Ten Commandments all over again. Christians didn't believe that. We believed in the grace of the Lord Jesus. But all of a sudden, boom, people started being told we got to keep the Sabbath. And now if you go to a Lutheran or Baptist or a Presbyterian, they think, oh yeah, we keep the Ten Commandments. Wait a minute, how come you don't keep the Sabbath? Oh, well, I guess we're hypocrites. And then Armstrong, Herbert Armstrong came along and was like, we got to keep all the holy days, blah, blah, blah. This kingdom good news has never been preached in all the world for 2,000 years. Right? And here's the truth. we got to go back to being Judaizers. Keep all the holy days. What about all these sacrifices and, and slavery and gen No, we don't do that part. But we do keep all these holy days and the Sabbath. Why, why does Paul say that we're not to observe days and seasons and years and, and, and Sabbaths? Right? Why does, why does Paul say we're under no law at all? Well, we don't believe in Paul. Now it's got to that point. We don't believe in Paul. So that's quite an apostasy where they have turned from even believing in the Bible... But that's not the worst of it. People from all angles are being apostatized, if you could say it that way. Like I say, uh, Marx and, and, and this scientific rationalism, and they don't even believe in the divine being. Most, most of the world leaders were atheists, and now the ones who say they believe in the divine being are lying. I just put a video out about Joe Biden and showed you some of his lies. They're actors. They don't really believe in any divine being. And the way high up people who really run the show, they do certainly believe in a deity, and it is Jehovah, and they personally know full well that Jehovah is the devil. And I know a lot of people who've never seen my videos are like, what in the world? Well, hang on. I'm going to show you some interesting things here. But... The biggest thing that ever happened was that in these last many years here, or since World War II, there have been these groups that have just canvassed the world to get everybody to go back to the law, back to judging one another. You know, the world seems to like that because they want to put a lot of people in jail. They want to, you know, judge everybody and accuse everyone and take them to court. We got to have war. We got to have war, war, war. Christians have always been forced to believe in this war. So this is why government, which is, you know, Moses, that's what government is, law, have tried to continue to keep people away from this grace thing, right? away from this freedom thing, and keep us in bondage to the law. So they can, and, and one way they do it is to threaten us and say, well, you've got to have law because, look, 
There's people coming to kill you, therefore you've got to go to war. Well, Jesus said not to go to war. Well, that's, that's crazy. Jesus is stupid. So then it goes from there to, all right, now we're like schizophrenic. And we're like, well, you're not allowed to defend yourself. Only the government can defend itself, right? And, and, and you don't even get defended by the government. The government's just defending itself against you. I mean, this gets real convoluted. But the one thing that would be the greatest marker of apostasy would be the turning away of mankind as a whole from the divine worship of the true divine being. Now, the divine being is everywhere, in all, through all, and above all. And Christ said, ye are the Elohim. Yes. But, you see, the Bible does teach that as a man, as a mortal, we are not to be worshipped. I will show you in a minute some verses that tell us very clearly that we should never worship a man. But yet, Jesus said, ye, talking to humans, are the Elohim. Are we not to worship Ha Elohim? The New World Translation translates Ha Elohim as the true divine being, the true God, they, they translated. And yet, humans are told not to worship humans in the Bible, and we'll show you that. Why? Because as humans, we're not even in the kingdom of the divine. We're in another kingdom under the authority of Yahweh, and in Yahweh's kingdom, you must only worship him. But Christians are no part of this world, and the gospel or the mysteries and the teachings of truth that were once and for all delivered by the mouth of the holy prophets and apostles 2,000 years ago announced to the world the true divine being, which had not yet been made known to former generations. And the angels came and they adored him. And the Magi came and they adored, worshipped him. And that word, even though in some translations they try to, to use another uh, synonym, but it is the exact same word that is used throughout the New Testament as worship, and in which the Bible tells us we should only give this particular word, worship, this is the way they translate it most of the time, worship. Uh, they, we should only devote that, whatever that word is, true to the divine being. So, in 1954, Jehovah's Witnesses publicly put it in print that worship should not go to Jesus anymore. Now, they had believed that when they first started, they worshiped Jesus, because everybody did. I mean, how are you going yeah, to say you're Christian if you don't worship Jesus? When the Bible, all the way through, everybody was worshiping Jesus, and we'll show you those verses. And the Bible says, but don't worship others, but worship Jesus. And everybody knew that, and everybody knew that Jehovah was the devil, so therefore they didn't use the word Jehovah when they first started. They had to slowly break us into this apostasy, little by little, line upon line. The great deception was waiting to pounce. It may have started in intervals, and maybe in 1914, a few things got screwed up, and people started, you know, maybe back in 325 with the Nicene Council, maybe with... The, the, the putting out of the flame or the or the burning of the library in Alexandria, maybe the, the the beginning of the Holy Roman Empire, maybe lots of different things. Maybe in France when they burned Bibles and made a big bonfire and burned Christians to stake. There's lots of times we could say this is a great apostasy. But after World War II, when they started announcing that there was a greater, higher, advanced form of being called an alien, little green men, and hoaxing the entire world into believing that they had landed and started showing us these saucers, you know, in the newspapers all the time and saying, they're coming, they're coming. And science began to say, oh yeah, there's all these other planets and they probably live out there. We're getting messages, right? Yeah, the, the regime over there in Bavaria, they were talking about getting these messages from Alderbar, which is the eye of Taurus in the direction of the southern 
part of the sky, which in Job says is hell, the, the lower uh, southern chambers of the south. It's a prison. And even Jehovah's Witnesses, when they first started up until I don't know what year, believed that their deity, and they worshipped Jehovah from the beginning. They just didn't make it very public. They didn't announce the word Jehovah, Jehovah, Jehovah yet. You know, They didn't call themselves Jehovah's Witnesses. But they still worshipped Jehovah. And they said he lived on a, on a star called Alcyon. Well, guess what? Alcyon is just beyond Aldebaran in the exact same direction in the Pleiades. And the Pleiades is the seven maidens that ride the back of Taurus. They're sitting on the shoulders of Taurus as if they're riding the beast. And Alcyon was the, was the chief of these seven maidens. And that is that direction towards the center of the galaxy deep into the south. And so the idea that people have worshipped this being that goes deep into our past because you have to understand when you're looking back in that direction you're looking into the past and so all the occult because remember Jehovah's Witnesses were started by Masons Charles Russell was a Mason of a 33 degree they all believed that they worshipped this being called Jehovah this was you can look in Albert Pike's Morals and dogma, and that's what they worship is Jehovah. Okay. And they all said that he dwelled out there towards the center. You go to Orion, the star Cyrus, and beyond that, Alderbarn and Alcyon. And that's where this Jehovah dwells. And so they began the occult in various forms. They created Seventh day Adventists to get us all to go back to the Sabbath. Herbert Armstrong, by the way, who was in Pasadena, where his cult was established, which is also the same place that Aleister Crowley, who was brought over here by Charles Russell, set up his school, the Templi Ordi, or whatever it's called, of the Orient, where he taught these evil mysteries, the dark side of the mysteries, where they worshipped Jehovah. And he had a school and a cult after Charles Russell died, he took over. And he had certain disciples such as Anton LaVey who started the Church of Satan and certain individuals who started NASA, the CIA, and individuals like uh, L. Ron Hubbard who started Scientology. And that was a big, it's a big presence there in Hollywood. Anton LaVey was a big presence in the music industry. But... This is an evil takeover. This is the great apostasy. Hollywood is the great apostasy. Created by Charles Taze Russell. But the actual thing that they published or the actual teaching that they put in their pamphlets and canvassed the world with is this idea that we should never worship Jesus. He was only a man. The angel Michael. We've said before, angel means L. And L, and is heavenly, L. So the heavenly L's, there's more than one. The Elohim is plural. And there is the father of the divine beings that Jesus even used a Greek term for, Uranus, who was the father of the gods and whose son was Zeus and others. And he had an, an evil son that fought with Zeus all the time and that was Saturn or the Egyptian set or the word we call Satan. So, when Jesus was on the cross, he cried out, Eli, Eli, Allah sabachthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Eli is L with an I on the end, which means my God or my L. Jesus used the word L for his divine being. He never once ever used the word Jehovah. And we can show and prove that to be the case. We can find evidence that the Apostle Paul said that Jesus was the Lord, where he referenced a scripture in Psalms, it's all about El Elyon. That's what the, Psal the book of Psalms is. David wrote most of it. And he wrote most of it to El and Elohim. And this is where Jesus quotes, he says, Ye are Elohim and the scripture cannot be broken. Ye are the gods because it, it, it's Psalms 82. And But in that Psalms, it says that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And 
the New World Translation changed that, took words out of the Bible and added words and changed that to Jehovah rather than Kyrios in the Septuagint Bible, the Holy Textus Receptus, and started going by this Talmudic Jewish Masoretic uh, manuscripts that were invented at a whole cloth in 900 A.D. But the Apostle Paul quotes that verse and says that that Lord that everybody must confess is Jesus Christ. But let me show you a verse in Matthew chapter 2. And I'm going to read from the beginning, verse 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men. Oh, these were wise men. Astrologers. <gasps> what? Christians can't believe in astrology. This is crazy. Well, they were astrologers and they were wise. They came from the east saying, where is that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Worship him. And then go down to verse 8 and it, we'll start with verse 7. Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. What is that word worship? Well, let's go back here and click on it and go into the inner linear so we can get the Greek. And we'll go down to where they, they use the word worship and we see that the word is 4352 proscunio to do reverence to bow your knee obedience to worship properly to kiss the ground and prostrate yourself before someone and worship them now is that really does that really mean to worship or just to be honoring somebody well let me show you something well let me let me go back and get verse 8 as well let's read the whole thing and I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, Seest thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren the prophets and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. Hmm, what is that word? Worship. 4352 to do reverence to go down on your knees and do obeisance or worship. You see, you're not supposed to worship even angels. Now let's look at this other verse. That was 22, 9. But further in Revelation 19, verse 10, I might have to start in verse 9 here. It says, and he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of the divine. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he saith unto me, Seeth thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren, that I have the testimony of Jesus, worship deity. So, here's an angel, and twice John tries to worship him, bow down, do obeisance. And the angel specifically says, only do this obeisance, this worship, this adoration to the divine being. Okay. Now we've said the angels are divine. They're elves. They're higher elves. But they, all of them, do not wish to be worshipped. They want us always to worship our Divine Mother, our Divine Heavenly Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is from the Scriptures, and this is what the world has lost. This is the great apostasy. When we have fallen away from worshipping the true Divine Being and have gone to worshipping the God of the Old Testament, the Devil, the Deity of Vengeance, whose name is Jealous, and will not pardon your sins, and in his wrath said, you'll not enter into my rest. 
who Jesus said, your father, looking at the Sanhedrin, is the devil and a liar and a murderer from the beginning. He is from beneath, but my father is from above. He is from this world, but I am no part of this world. My kingdom is no part of this world. So, then take a look at Matthew chapter 2, verse 11. And let's go down to the King James. And it says, And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary's mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Remember the song? Come let us adore him. Come let us adore him. Come let us adore him, Christ the Lord. You see, we used to believe that, friends. We used to be Christians. We used to know that Jesus was real. We used to know that he was the Lord. We used to know that in his name only are we saved. And through him and by him and for him. We used to worship him and we knew that the Old Testament was wrong and that that was the deity of vengeance. We knew this. The great apostasy has come. And yes, friends, that word worship there is the same word, 4352. Proscunio. Do reverence. Now, take a look at this as well. Here is Matthew 14.33. And let me get that in context. King James Version says, uh, Peter answered him and said, Lord, right? Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Peter's about to get saved. This is the true Lord. If thou bid me come unto thee on the water, and he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and he began to sink. And he cried saying, Lord, save me. See, we're saved by the Lord. Why? Because he's got salvation power. Because he is divine. Because we should worship him. But most people can't understand this. And they begin to sink in their own doubts and confusion in this world. But you see, immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they were in the ship and they came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth thou art the son of the divine one. You see, who is this man that can still the wind, calm the sea? Only the divine being can by his mouth say to the wind, cease, and to the waves, stop, be still, and say unto that mountain, be moved. Well, guess what? Jesus said we could do that with faith. Why? Because Christ said, I and the Father are one. So just as the Divine Father is the Divine One, is Deity. The fullness of that Divine Pleroma dwelleth bodily in Christ and we can worship Him. But, remember, Jesus said, just as I am in the Father and the Father in me, ye may be in us. Now, we are not already in Him. We do not have that faith yet. We must abide in the vine. We must hang on to the love and cast out the fear. But when we open our eyes and recognize the Christ in us, as the Apostle Peter did, and then he was able to walk on water and do all kinds of things, heal the sick and raise the dead. Why? Because then Peter came to understand what that power was. It was that divine power that dwelled in him in bodily form. That was the Lord Jesus and his Heavenly Father and our Divine Mother, the Holy Spirit. The feminine rock Elohim. So, now let's go back to another verse. Matthew 28, 9. Let's get that in context. Start with verse 8. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples word 
And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail! And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. And then said Jesus unto them, Don't worship me! No, he didn't say that. And then Jesus said unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee and there they shall see me also. You see? And then they can worship me too. You see? And then you can understand that I am in the Father and the Father is in me and that ye are also in me and in my Father and that ye also are Elohim and that ye also can be filled with his great divine power and command the sea and move mountains. But you must understand that the head of this body is Jesus. We're all one body, many members in one body. And the head cannot say unto the toe, I have no need of thee. So if you're just a toe in this body, Jesus is never going to say, I don't need you. We need each other. And as Christians, we don't worship each other. We're just the body. Okay? We know that we're loved and we're needed, but we worship the Lord Jesus. Now, look at John chapter 20 and verse 28, and we'll go down and get that in context. Verse 26, we'll read, After eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them, and then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Do you know what the root of the word peace is in the original language that the Old Testament was written in? That word, the root word, means to be whole, to be complete. And that's what it means to be at peace, to be at rest, to be in the oneness of the body of Christ. And he said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he unto the Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Believing what? That some man was raised from the dead? Not necessarily that somebody was raised from the dead. That's only to prove to you something else. What is it we've got to believe? And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, Thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Friends, it's imperative that we understand and believe in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We're not the Lord and Savior. None of the angels are the Lords and Saviors. We are in the divine being because the divine being is in all through all and above all, but fully and completely embodied in Christ Jesus so that that is the head of this divine power that is the authority that all of heaven and earth is under. Jesus said, I have all authority in heaven and upon earth. And the Apostle Paul says, there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Now look at this. Acts chapter 10 verse 25. We'll get that in context. We'll start with verse 24. And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea and Cornelius waited for them and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. Okay, this is a story about Peter who brought the gospel to Cornelius. And Cornelius began to worship Peter. But Peter raised him up and said, Stand up! I myself also am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. So you see, Peter did not let people worship him. Even though he could do all these powerful things because he knew that Christ was in him. He knew that he was connected and one with the Lord. But he did not accept worship. But when anyone worshipped Jesus, he never rebuked them or resisted it, ever. And the Bible was full of verses that tell us we should worship Jesus and that in his name, all things should be done. Everything. Every time you pray, every time you go in or come out, 
or get up or lay down. Every blessing and everything we do must be in the name of Jesus. For in him and him alone is salvation come upon men. However, the verse that I find the most compelling is in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 6. Let's start with verse 5. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, does that include Michael the archangel? Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of the divine one worship him. Let them worship Jesus, all the angels. And unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O divine one, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore deity, even thy deity, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thine hands. So it's telling us that Jesus created the world. And they shall perish, but thou, Jesus, remaineth. And they will all wax old as doth a garment, as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy ears shall never fail. But to which of the angels said he at any time, sit at my right hand until I make thee thine enemies thy footstool? Are they, the angels, not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? But notice verse 8, especially. Unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O deity. See, he's talking to the Son. He says, thy throne, O deity, is forever and ever. That's pretty, <laughs> that's pretty divine throne, right? Forever and ever. He's called the divine being. And it's thy kingdom. And verse 10 to which of the angels did he say this? He only said this to Jesus. And this is in the book of Psalms. And it says, Thou, O Lord, O Lord Jesus. That's who that Lord is in the book of Psalms. That's how we know that the Masoretic scribes have lied and Jehovah's Witnesses have put the name of Jehovah where it ought not be. Because this is Jesus. Thou, O Lord Jesus, in the beginning hast laid the foundations of the earth. So, of course, if he created everything and he is called the Divine One and he sits upon his Divine Throne and he's called the Divine One many times, the Savior even divine by Paul and Titus and Timothy and, you know, Peter says it and John and all of them. Then I guess we can worship or we must worship Jesus for is the only name given whereby we must be saved. And it's in his name that we're all saved. We must confess his name. So, guys, I hope this has kind of opened your eyes a little bit. A little bit more, you know? And we begin to really realize that we need to be very, very careful because this great deception is spreading it has all kinds of tentacles. It comes in through many doors to get into your mind and your heart. And we got a lot of New Ageism. Had a lot of truth. Christians didn't know about reincarnation, karma, and all this stuff. Did you know that Buddha is going to return? Yeah, I'm going to do a video on that here maybe tomorrow or something. Buddha's talked about in the Bible. And he's going to return before Jesus does. And I know that sounds crazy. So you say, okay, well, this is just a bunch of uh, New Ageism you're teaching there, Dave. Listen, we're going to teach the truth right straight from the Bible. But, you see, we're not going to just go out there and make up our own ideas from people who wrote a book uh, 20 years ago or 100 years ago from apostates, and that's spreading like wildfire. And it's like, it's all people want to hear. You go on these other channels that are talking about uh, this astrotheology. A lot of beautiful truths being taught. 
You know, the idea that we are the divine one. Well, in a sense, we are. Jesus taught us this. We're his children. Of course we're divine. And yes, we've got to grow up in the maturity and we can move those mountains. But when we begin to start following the leader in just every little pernicious lie that they tell, oh, there's no more Jesus. You know, you're just, if, if you don't believe in Jesus, but you're believing these deep esoteric teachings, then it's got to be that you didn't get these esoteric teachings from the Bible through prayer. You got them from some guy on YouTube. Isn't wrong to listen to people on YouTube, but we've got to read the scriptures ourselves carefully and prayerfully and ask our Heavenly Father, what is the truth? Why would we reject the Lord that bought us? Why would we deny the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're following right, we're playing right into the hands of these cults, all created by these Illuminati Satanists that have been preparing the world to stop believing in Jesus and to go back again unto Jehovah. There is so much schizophrenia going on in the world. We've got people that think that they can just well, we'll just pick and choose. We'll be Buddhists now. Hey, Buddha was a prophet. But we don't follow Buddha. Why? Because Buddha was a predecessor of Jesus. And Jesus is the Lord incarnate. Jesus had other brothers. Jesus said Elihu was the greatest man ever born of a woman. And I'm going to show you in another video, scripturally, that Individuals like Elihu, who lived in the past, were great prophets that were sent to the world. And they're going to return. But they're not the divine being. They're not who we worship. We don't worship Buddha. Buddha was a great prophet who taught great, wonderful mysteries. As I've said, Daniel was the head of the Magi. At the very same time in history, that a man named Zoroaster was teaching the Magi religion up in Persia. I'm not going to go into that today. But you must understand, the Bible has prophesied a lot of things, much of it we have never been told. I was just watching a video yesterday about some guy, some Judean, that thought he understood that Hebrew was the most important language and that it was what this entire physical world was built on. He has no idea how much truth he just said there. And yet how confused he really is. Because this world is based on those words. And Yahweh, those letters are vowels and they bring into manifestation the consonants, the letters. And the Lord speaks and it was done. And so Yahweh brought everything into this carnal form. But what we need to understand is the true spiritual meaning of these words that all of these Kabbalists have no clue. Have no clue. Because it's been hidden from them and revealed unto the babes. And in the end, all of these little fine points, we're all searching and we're, we're hungry for this information. And it will all be revealed in the Lord's due time. But the most important thing is that we do not literally apostatize from the holy truth once delivered unto the saints by the apostles that our divine Lord and Savior came to the world goodwill towards men and brought the gospel the good news of our salvation that we have eternal life by simply receiving by His grace as a free gift, eternal life. And once we simply put faith in Him and cry out to Him, He promises that He will hear us. And He has promised us that anyone who 
calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And that means delivered. And the Bible tells you over and over again in other places that this deliverance is a deliverance from the wrath that's coming. This great trial that's coming upon the earth. The test, the book of Revelation says, the ten days of trial. He'll keep us from it. We're not appointed under the wrath. And all we have to do is through endurance, we will gain our souls. Not one hair of our heads will be harmed. We shall remain until he comes if we keep our white robes unspotted from the world and learn to master that song, that ten-string instrument, the truth, by prayer and through thanksgiving and through faith in his name. I'm going to go ahead and go, guys. I hope you have a wonderful day. May the Lord bless you. We'll see you tomorrow and have a good one.